which means peace be unto you welcome to another episode of the Dean show we have a great topic for you today something very interesting Muslim you know what a Muslim is one who surrenders and submits to one God worshiping him alone without any associates and then you know what an atheist is Atheist is something that's weird, just something that's way out there, but you got some people that are weird and they're atheists. But today we have someone who's a former Muslim atheist. Did I catch you by surprise? Well, it kind of caught me also, but we're going to be back with our next guest and we're going to help clear this up. What do we mean? Is that possible? A Muslim atheist? When we come back on the Dean Show, we'll be right back. Allah. There's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that, maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? Very good. Alhamdulillah. Noman Ali Khan. Yes. Alhamdulillah. How are you, brother? Very good. Very good. I'm Inshallah. very excited to have you on the show. Thank I'm you. Very for excited to be on. here. Alhamdulillah. All right. You got your. Uh, this is a gift for you. You got the Dean Show cup. You can take home with you. Fantastic. Now I have <laughs> something to give my kids uh, candy and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the wonderful work that you're doing. But before that. <laughs> We're going to talk about what I just had mentioned, Muslim atheist. Is that even possible? I don't think so. But it kind of happens in the classic sense. Oh. Um, what he was referring to and uh, what you were referring to is a little bit of uh, an internal struggle that I went through when I was at the age of about junior, high, you know, junior in high school, mm -hmm. senior in high school. Um, basically, it was a loss of religion. So when I came to the United States, this was about in ninth grade, um, you know, I came, it was a culture shock. And a lot of the values that I was raised with were all being questioned all at the same time. And there was really nobody that I could talk to or uh, verify my own beliefs with. And eventually what happens in the school environment is you make friends, you know, based on proximity, based on common interest, whoever is accessible to you. So most of my friends were people that were either polytheists or uh, they were actually atheists. What do you mean polytheists? Uh, some Hindus, some yeah. Buddhists. Um, Those are, they worship multiple gods? They were, worship multiple gods and okay. they actually each of them had their own different god among themselves. So. Okay, that's a big no-no. Yeah, um, and uh, a good number of them, very smart people, were actually atheists. So, you know, falling into that crowd and just not being around any Muslims generally, um, I kind of had hid these thoughts and these confusions from my family because I knew how taboo they can be and you can't really share these kinds of confusions at home. Um, so I kind of learned to live with them. And over time what that ended up happening was I had a really a good bunch of really messed up friends. And uh, my company became such that was I actually had a hatred almost for the concept of God. I, was, I, I thought it was a detestable concept. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd reached that point. And subhanAllah, it is by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah opened many, many, many doors, one after another for me, that I couldn't have opened for myself, that led me back to Iman, it led me back to my faith and back to my conviction. Oh, we, 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 we hear something, you said some uh, uh, Arabic words, you're going to have to define them okay. here on the Dean show, we got a lot of non-Muslims okay. listening, and you said, I think I caught two of them there, you said Iman and back it up. Okay, Allah. Iman is conviction and faith. Yeah. Um, so I said I was led back to my conviction, back to Iman, that's the... Uh, the Arabic term for faith, and it's actually related to the term amn, which is peace. So actually, we be Muslims believe that your faith is actually a source of peace for you and others. Um, on the other hand, uh, the other term I used was alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. which is my expression and all Muslims' expressions of uh, expressing our, faith, uh, our, our gratitude and our appreciation of what Allah does for us. So um, 
And you said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I mean Allah is His name, uh, His glorified name. Subhanahu, that part of it means uh, how perfect He is. That's the raw translation of subhanahu wa ta'ala means how elevated, how high he, he is. Meaning we aren't to say something that is belittling the status of Allah. Okay, they can put their Arabic books away now. Okay, so, <laughs> okay cool. So were your parents, were they devout Muslims? Were they practicing? Were they not practicing? How they were uh, semi-practicing Muslims. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I wouldn't call them strictly religious, yeah. but they there was some practice in our home. My dad was fairly regular with his prayers. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have religion far beyond that at the home. Um, but really, religion and, and belief became a thing that I associated more with my friends than I did with the family over time. And actually, it reminds me of a famous uh, statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Arabic goes, Al-mar'u ala deeni khalilihi, fal yanzur ahadukum man yukhalil. What that means is, a person depends on the religion of their friend. Mm. And watch out who you make friends with. Yeah. Uh, and those words actually ring a really strong bell with me in my life. Uh, and have a great impact on the advice I give to other youth because uh, no matter how smart you think you are or how on top of your faith you are it's just a matter of having messed up friends and you're just gonna get just as messed up if not worse than you are now depending on that so so I was at that stage in my life and uh, there were two kinds of doors that Allah opened for me mm -hmm. one of them uh, was intellectual and that was a little later but the other one was social. Allah opened uh, a door for me in college where I met uh, a person that I would probably never have associated, imagined being friends with. And I kind of, you would call it by chance, ran into him. And, you know, just sitting in the hallway, just hanging out. I see this, this guy come up and just post a flyer on the, you know, the college billboard where, you, where all these clubs post their flyers. Yeah. And it says Muslim Student Association. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm like, what is this Muslim story? They must really party because they might, they might get all the Muslims from all the different countries yeah. <laughs> and jam together. That's what I thought it was, right? Yeah. So, so I go to him and I start talking to him. He's like, yeah, it's a lot of fun. You got to come and you know, it's going to be great. Um, so all the other clubs that I was part of, I skipped out on and I went to this supposedly great party club that I was going to join. And uh, so I go there and there's no one in the room. Except that one guy that had put up the flyers and there's a box of pizza and he's kind of waiting for folks to show up. Um, so when I walked in, I felt kind of awkward, like I don't know what I'm, mm -hmm. if I really belong here or not. So uh, I was trying to leave, but he kind of reeled me in. We just start talking, eat a little pizza, become a little friend, yeah. you know, uh, a, a growing acquaintance. And uh, what ended up happening was I used to take the subway home. I used mm -hmm. to go to college in New York City. So I used to take the subway home and he would just instead give me a ride home. Mm -hmm. And he had a nice ride too, so yeah. it was kind of, it was nice of him. Yeah. And we'd stop by, grab a bite, you know, here and there, just hang out. And this was, this became almost every two, three days, I'd just go hang out with him. Mm -hmm. No Islam, no religion, nothing. Yeah. It was just, he was just a friend, that's all. Mm -hmm. And after a few months of just giving me a ride and hanging out, being great company, giving good advice on what professors to take classes with, because he was a senior in college, I was a freshman. Yeah. Uh, you know, he says to me, you know, uh, one time we're stuck in traffic on the LA, you still remember, he's like, uh, we're getting late um, to get home, you mind if I stop and pray Maghrib? And it had just so happened that the prayer times never conflicted in my commute home with him. Yeah, now that's the, so, that, that's the uh, fourth prayer of the day. This is the fourth prayer, this is the evening did, prayer. Did you know at, what that at, was? Uh, you knew from your parents? I, I did back then, but I yeah. hadn't, at that point, it must have been at least six years that I had prayed at all. Yeah. I mean, Friday, eat, whatever. I hadn't prayed anything at all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he says, you mind if I stop? And I said, okay, yeah, why not? So he goes and I kind of inexplicably feel the urge to pray with him. I kind of felt bad. Mm -hmm. So I go and I make wudu and I'm, I pray with him at, the, at this masjid uh, in Queens. And it kind of, I felt something, mm -hmm. you know, that I hadn't felt in a very long time, just a kind of peace. Yeah. Um, I tried to bury it for a while, but mm -hmm. then, alhamdulillah, uh, again, praise and glory and thanks be to Allah and appreciation uh, only becoming of Allah, that he, he gave me that consistent company and through him I got to meet a lot of wonderful people. He just kind of connected me to just some amazing people, one of which is Imam Siraj Wahaj, mm -hmm. um, you know, a great hero of our community. Um, he's just some really mesmerizing individuals and he in acquainted me with other young Muslims that were very active in their community just doing things that matter you know and they were they were trying to make uh, the world a better place kind of thing and it made me think like all these people have such sense of 
sense of purpose. Where are they getting it from? But you didn't really have a purpose then, did no, you? No, I just, I mean... What, I, what were some of your ambitions? I mean, you obviously, a Muslim one is striving for the hereafter to please his Lord to become the best human being he could possibly be. What were your ambitions? I mean, before I turned to Deen, yeah. um, I don't think I really had much of an ambition. I was, I mean, if you, if you ask the average college youth, what are your goals in life? They'll say, I don't know, I'll think about it later. Yeah. That kind of thing, you know? They just want to take one day at a time, just live it up, live for the day sort of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, you can't really think be even beyond your immediate semester. Only when you get like to junior year, senior year in college, you start thinking about your career or like what major you want to do and things like that. So even in the worldly sense, uh, young people tend to be very, and at least myself, I was very apathetic. Like I didn't really care. It was kind of like, you know, uh, let it just all slide. Yeah. You know. But anyway, uh, because he connected me to these individuals. Yeah. One of the things he did for me was uh, he introduced me to this program uh, that was going on in uh, the Muslim Center in Flushing, uh, which was basically in, in Ramadan, you know, Muslims get together and congregate in high numbers and the long taraweeh prayers go on at night. Uh, but, but this program was special in that there was taraweeh prayer and then it was coupled with a lecture series mm -hmm. of the entire Quran beginning to end in 30, day, in 30 nights. So you pray and listen to the recitation of Qur'an, but at the same time you get to hear the entire thing explained in brief. Mm -hmm. Translation and brief explanation. That's very key, now knowing what is being said. Right, there. and I had never, I mean, before this I had tried reading the translation of the Qur'an once, maybe the Yusuf Ali. Yeah. I found the English, may Allah reward him for his work, but yeah. I, I found the translation uh, biblical. Mm -hmm. And at that point, as you know, late high school, early college, I was like, okay, I don't know, I don't get this. So I yeah. put it aside. But then, um, what ends up happening is I uh, I listen to this live presentation of the Quran beginning to end. It's being presented as a dialogue, and what this is probably the first time in my life I came to realize for myself that the Quran is actually a dialogue, and Allah is talking to me. Mm -hmm. Right, the Lord of the worlds is directly engaged in conversation with me. You know, when you read a book, it's different. Mm -hmm. But when you hear a conversation, it has a different effect. Even yeah. now, like if you read an article of a great speech or a transcript of a great speech, it won't move you like that. But if you were at that speech mm -hmm. and it was a, the order knew what he was doing, that would really it would it would, it would rattle you, right? Yeah. So this ends up happening to me. I'm, I'm just mystified by this book. And I mean, I spent those thirty days. I mean, the, the thing was long. It was like one juz, a thirtieth of the Quran every night in explanation with the prayer. So this was like an 8 p.m. to like a 2 a.m., 3 a.m. endeavor. So, you know, I did this for the entire month and this was like my first exposure seriously to Islam after my childhood schooling. Mm -hmm. I was being exposed to the entire book in one shot with one teacher, with one, one uh, presenter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at that point I had started listening to other lectures and talks by different speakers and presenters on various topics, just gaining curiosity in Islam. Mm -hmm. But of all the things I had heard, I had never heard something so moving as the Qur'an presented itself. Let it speak for itself. So at the end of the 30 days, I went to the, the presenter, his name is Dr. Abdul Sami. Yeah. And I said to him, um, a lot of people are doing things for Islam, mm -hmm. but I want to do what you do. How do you do what you do? I want, I want to be what you're doing. Now ho hold that point, we're going to get to that. And tell us, before you went and you had this experience, yeah. Being an atheist, did you check into any other religions like no. Buddhism, Christianity? Did you like kind of? I took a lot of philosophy courses in college. Philosophy. Yeah, and uh, it was actually more of a turnoff than anything else. Uh -huh. um, I was very dismayed, first of all, by other religious um, theologies, because the, the inconsistency wasn't even something you find later on. It's right on the front page. Yeah. You know, it's it's you don't even have to go further to. You saw it on the front page. It was. Just, it was like just move on. You yeah. know. Um, and it kind of, it generally, it turns you off from religion in general. Because you figure, okay, this religion doesn't make any sense. By assumption, all religions must be this nonsensical. Okay. Right? And this is what a lot of people do, actually. They find one religion that doesn't make sense. So they make that assumption for all religions. They yeah. say, ah, they're all man-made, or they're all this way or that way. Um, I did study some Islamic uh, uh, philosophy in college, but it was presented by a Zoroastrian professor, uh -huh. most probably an agnost himself. Um, so he presented it in a very strange kind of way, so I didn't really see anything to it. But though in my mind, uh, I was already, the, the idea of uh, 
Islam being more than just a spiritual thing, it being an intellectual thing, was fermenting. It was in, my, in the back of my mind. Why do you think this is a very important? Because I'm sure there are people, closet Muslims, or people who are born into families that are Muslims, but you have to make a subconscious decision to yeah. submit yourself. Yeah. So it's not by default, now you just got it uh, made. I got two things to say about that. Yeah. Atheism uh -huh. is actually a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. It doesn't occur naturally. Not at all. No. You made, you made a good point. We spoke uh, earlier that when a person is up and, and hits some turbulence in a plane. Yeah, and this is what Allah says in the Quran. He turns off his atheism. It, it <laughs> or, just, for those few seconds, oh God, save me. Yeah. You know? Or they say uh, there's no uh, atheist in foxholes. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now you have. Uh, so that's one thing about atheism. The other thing about atheism is it's actually not rooted, at least from all the atheist friends that I had, it's not rooted in something intellectual. That's the facade. It's actually rooted in something psychological. These people are either traumatized, or they had a really bad experience in life, or they've seen something that they were really emotionally disturbed by. They decided to blame God for it, right? And as part of their reaction against God, let, you know what, what's the biggest offense I can do? He doesn't even exist. Right? Yeah. So it starts with questioning God and then moves on to the ultimate, uh, you know, supposedly offense against God. I don't even think he exists. So this would be something, like I said earlier, this is weird. Isn't it weird? Something? It is weird. It is, uh, it's, uh, to me, it's actually a disorder. Yeah. And these are disturbed people. They're, I mean, if, if you've come to the conclusion of atheism, first of all, uh, you've made an absolute statement about something you have no idea. Right? The, the agnost is different from the atheist. The agnost at least says, I don't know. Maybe there is a God, maybe there isn't. I don't have a way of knowing. Mm -hmm. In that, at least there is some acknowledgement of humility that I don't know. Right? At least there's that much. And we can work with that somewhat. But the atheist, with explicit, like absolute you know, certainty, says there's absolutely no way there's a God. And he's absolutely de denying something that he can't even see or judge. So his, basically then he's saying, he or she, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. Right? If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. This is the, the essence of their intellectual problem. Right? They say that it, you know, the only thing that can be judged is empirical evidence, meaning the five senses, science, this is what exists. That's it. But even then, who decided what the five senses are? Who decided that these are the only sources of knowledge, etc.? No answer. Where does uh, love come from? Where does hate come from? Where does fear come from? Emotions? Uh, where does hope and aspiration come from? Oh, they're just chemicals in our body. Mm -hmm. So they want to reduce the human being even to just a sophisticated animal. And because they've done that, you'll find these different kinds of weird crimes in our society that you never found in history. Like the, the craziest kinds of things, sickest kinds of things people do, when they have no sense of consequence. They have no purpose left in life. There's no one watching over them. There's, there's no one they have to answer for. If they can get away with it, they'll get away with it. And that's the society in which you get these heinous crimes. Like, we're not even talking about murder and stealing and, you know, yeah. these are your average Joe crimes. We're talking about just sick, disturbing, I don't understand why anybody would do this kind of thing, yeah. kinds of crimes. That's a byproduct of atheism. You've given, you've taken hope and purpose away from people and they're, Allah calls them animals or even worse, this is the even worse part. So tell us, maybe there's somebody here that you know what, he can relate to what you have to say. He might be somehow covering up that belief in the one God and in, in, in something that's really rational and he doesn't want to be weird anymore. Yeah. How would you invite him and give him some, just some, some basic da'wah, okay. inviting him in, in to you know, something that's natural? I could, I could speak from my personal experience. Yeah. On the one hand, you have to have sincerity and nobody can put that in you. You have to, you have to beg for it if you... If you Kind of even say, if there's a God out there, I need sincerity. I sincerely seek you out. Mm -hmm. I'm sincerely in search of you. Ask for the guidance. Ask for the guidance. Um, the other thing is, beyond that leap, beyond that seeking of guidance, what brought me to absolute conviction after my background in philosophy yeah. and like, you know, this atheist phase and rationalizing everything, that exposure to Quran that I had wasn't just a spiritual experience. It was actually a very powerful intellectual experience for me. Like, every major argument I had against religion or God was answered without me having to ask a question. I was just listening to Quran carefully, and it was, un it was like there were a lot of knots in my mind, and it was just 
undoing them one after another. The Quran answered all the questions, yeah. all the doubts that you had. All the doubts that I had. I think that's one problem people have. They might be born in a family of atheists or some other religion, and they use their intellect and they see that this stuff don't make sense. It's weird. Yeah. And now they paint everything with the same brush. This but Islam is not that? Islam is not that. But I tell you one more advantage that I did have uh -huh. is that I had somebody who had given their life to studying the Quran, yeah. simplifying it for me. And this is a big deal. Like, even the average person, if they read the Quran for themselves, right, they will get guidance. I know people that went to the public library, read the Quran, and became Muslim. Yeah. Right? And this does happen. But there's also the chance of you reading the Quran, and because there are so many passages that are contextual, and you know, if you don't understand that context, um, and that entire scenario, you're not really going to get what, what it's saying. So you might even read the Quran and come out a little confused. You might, you might say, I wonder what that's about. Yeah. Or why is this here? Why is that there? And this is what actually some evangelicals like to pick on, right? Yeah. They'll take a bitter piece of the Quran, bitten piece of the Quran, and they'll take it out entirely out of context, out of yeah. historical and textual context, and say, aha, look at what your book says, right? Um, but on the, look at the flip side, just on quoting out of context. Uh, the Quran says, وَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ There's two, two verses, if you will. I like the word ayah better, rather than verse, because it's proprietary to the Quran. It says, the ultimate destruction uh, is to fall upon those who pray. That's the first verse. Those who, in regards to their prayers, are heedless. They're careless in regards to their prayer. Now, if you just take the first verse, and say, ultimate destruction is for those who pray and you forget the rest of the context, you get this crazy conclusion yeah. that the Qur'an is saying people who pray are destroyed. Mm -hmm. But it's talking about people who don't care about their prayer, yeah. who, who make a mockery of prayer, right? So, context is really important. And that's the benefit I had with, with this teacher. The entire Qur'an presented in context. And it really, I, without doing any formal training in Islamic studies, this was my first exposure formally, formally in Islamic studies, um, or in a thorough way. What this did for me was basically solidify, this is what I have to say. If I want to confirm my conviction, I have to become a student of this book. So over the last nine years or so, and it's still going on, uh, first I became a student of the Arabic language, then I became a student of this, it's a specific science in Islamic studies called the science of tafsir, yeah. which is the science of uh, studying the explanation of the Qur'an, the scholarly explanation of the Qur'an in connection with the other sacred literature in Islam, the Sunnah. Mm -hmm. So the Qur'an and Sunnah come together and you properly understand tafsir, though there are other components too. So I became a student of this area specifically, because it, it, it brought me to the deen, it brought me to my conviction, it pulled me out of my darkness into whatever light Allah had brought me to. Yeah. So I stuck to this topic. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there are other topics in Islam, you, you can study fiqh, you can study aqidah, you can study many different topics. I studied them so much as they apply to my personal life. But as an endeavor, I stuck to two things, Arabic, classical Arabic studies and Qur'an-related studies. Uh -huh. And within that journey, what happened was, in the first couple of years, I was looking at uh, the message of the Qur'an, understanding comprehensively its lessons, its teachings, its, its overwhelming, overlying themes, right? Yeah. So like the bigger picture of the Qur'an. But then over the last, I think, about four years now, my focus changed to what makes the Qur'an miraculous. Mm -hmm. So the first part was the message of the Qur'an and the latter part became the miracle of the Qur'an. And when I was first introduced to that topic, I, even though I had been the student of the Qur'an for a few years already, when I first got introduced to the topic formally on the miraculous power of the Qur'an, I felt like I hadn't been studying Qur'an before. Like I, I thought I knew what it's saying, but I never saw it in this light. Mm -hmm. So what Allah opened for me subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, uh, may his name be glorified and he deserves the attribution of all perfection uh, what he opened for me was a door to appreciate this Quran in an entirely new light now uh, to sum this up basically most people uh, their experience with the Quran even if you're like devout Muslims right Muslims or not your experience with the Quran is just as a message as a religious message you don't necessarily see it as a miracle. Like, I mean, imagine standing next to Moses, Musa alayhi salam, when the water's parting, mm -hmm. right? That kind of a miracle. We don't associate reading the Qur'an with that. Uh -huh. But if you engage in the study, it takes a little bit of an effort. Uh -huh. 
But if you engage in this study, you can begin to experience that miracle. We're almost out of time. Tell us for a couple of avenues. A person that is a Muslim, but he has doubts and he is kind of confused. You know, parents going through the rituals. He's just going through the rit rituals and back like a robot. What advice to him? And you got the atheist attention also. He wants to know what's up with you, this miracle you're saying about the Quran. Yeah. Give us, we're going to do a show talking about the miracles of the Quran and how we will give proof and evidences that it is indeed not a man-made book, but a revelation from the Creator. Give us some, some uh, uh, advice for the Muslim and who was in your situation and the atheist. My advice to Muslims, my first bit of advice, company. You need company that is serious about learning the religion, that is supportive. Um, you, you may find that company on campus, you may find it at your local masjid, it might be the imam of your masjid. But find someone in your community that you look up to, that you can spend more and more and more time with. This is the key. In the end, like that hadith says, and it was true for me, our religion, in, it does depend on our company. We, you know, you have good company, your religion will benefit. You will grow intellectually. You'll have people that can address your concerns. And if they themselves can address your concerns, if they're sincere, they can point you to the right resources and people that can address your concerns. And this is what happened with me. I had a certain kind of question, and I got pointed to a certain kind of specialist in that area that would help me with that question. So this would be my, my probably primary advice. Yeah. Change, of Change of company. You know, don't waste your life away. If, you're, if your life looks the same every day, you just wake up, do some school or whatever, hang out, and then, you know, party and go to sleep. And that's your, your every day. So your entire life looks like one day. It, it's it's like there's no there's no uh, nothing new in your life. Just wasting right? time. It's just wasting your giving your life away. Yeah. Um, don't assume that you have all the time in the world. Our time, our clock is not in our hands. So feel a sense of urgency. Find good company and sincerely begin to look into the religion for for proper proper guidance. Also, uh, recently because of the advent of uh, programs like Al Maghrib Institute, where um, and others that are, you know, they're doing Islamic studies kinds of programs. Find those programs out and take classes. Tell us also the, the Baina, El Baina Institute, you're the uh, head yeah, of this. Yeah, Baina is uh, hooked up with El Maghrib. Yeah, it's now uh, in collaboration with El Maghrib, uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, the idea behind Baina was to facilitate Arabic studies for Muslims and general audiences across the United States. Uh, the reason I started it was I had to go through a very difficult journey in learning. Uh, and I didn't want other people to go through that journey. So I, as a student, developed uh, a program along with some colleagues uh, that the idea behind which was to get the message out there that Arabic is easy to learn. Actually, I would argue miraculously easy to learn despite it being such a complex language. If only you come to it with the intention that you want to learn Quran, there's actually divine intervention in how easy it becomes for you. So uh, with that intention, we started, alhamdulillah, it's been over 72 communities thus far across the country. Nearly 8,000 students. They can see. You, they can visit you at what your you have. A, uh, uh, yeah, it's bayina.com. Bayina.com. B a y y i n a h dot com. You can see our website, our programs that are being offered around and the country. We, we got one minute left. The atheists, you got you got to tell them something. Okay. Atheist, talk to them. Okay. So to my fellow human atheist, my sincere advice: if you even fathom the possibility that there is a creator. If that possibility, even like the slightest ounce of that possibility exists in your mind, consider the consequences of not reflecting on that possibility. If you are willing to take a chance on your life and your, 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 your well-being to guarantee yourself there's no hereafter at all, nobody's looking after me, nobody's going to question what I did, and you want to just live your life, if you're willing to take that risk, go ahead. God is not going to force you to, to accept Him. But if there's that minute idea in your head that you know if it's even possible that he exists and that he is he has given me guidance and he has expectations of me and I have deliberately chosen not even to think about it then the consequences are on you and, and not on him so with that that slightest possibility be sincere to that possibility for your own sake not for anybody else's and inquire into into the divine look in, and really ask for guidance in the end because as Muslims we know it's not our intellect that reaches God, or that we guide ourselves. Our intellect only goes so far, and then there's divine intervention. Something opens up in your chest, so you feel a peace, you feel an ease, and you'll, you'll be able to find that, that faith. But it is 
part of it is an intellectual journey and part of it is a spiritual journey. I know for an atheist, acknowledging anything spiritual is very, very difficult. But humble yourself. You've had spiritual experiences. No matter who you are, you've had a spiritual experience. Acknowledge that you, there's an entity inside you that isn't entirely rational or logical. We're not purely, log we're not machines. We're human beings. We have emotions. We have spirituality. So let that humanness of you seek out uh, the Lord of the world. Thank you very much. We're out of time okay. and we're going to okay. inshallah do some more shows with you. You're quite welcome. So they look forward to seeing more of uh, my brother Noman Ali Khan from the Baina Institute. Jazakallah Haider. May Allah reward you for being with us today. Yaakumullah. Thank you so much. benefit from your story. And I'd like to thank you and all of you that are out there supporting the Dean Show, coming back every week to see a new show. And all those people out there who are watching us trying to, to learn about Islam. It's the fastest going way of life out there. It's not something weird. Don't be weird. You don't want to be somebody standing out like an atheist. You're a small minority. You got what the, heard what the brother had to say. God wants to guide you. He's out there. But do you want to be guided? Start with that first step. Ask him to guide you. And then use the tools that he's given you. And the truth shall be made clear. We hope to see you again next time on the Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. Come and see what everyone's talking about. Prove. If you find one contradiction, it can't be from God. But the rational idea, the rational explanation is, you do your best. Give up worshiping God as one. I will never give up spreading this message. I hope that you take that necessary step. You don't know if you're going to live till tomorrow. So you got to find that urgency to do the right thing right now. The, the reality of life usually doesn't sink in until tragedy comes. You get a few bad people, the media grabs a hold of that and spends it the way they want to. If you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is attended our faith to you. It's cold, it's late. Everybody sleeping. I arise and ask Allah to forgive me. Oh Allah, you see. Oh Allah, you know all the sins I do. I turn to you to forgive my sins in my heart. I'm your sinful slave, you're my love.